Working class anti-heroes like Archie Bunker, Roseanne Barr, and perhaps most importantly, Frank Gallagher have united millions to rally around characters they'd normally scorn. And today on UTR, we're hobnobbing with four of them, so don't move a muscle. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Unproduced Table Read here on the Popcorn Talk Network. Today we're reading an awesome script written by our very own Tony Hamilton Shannon called Grafton, and it's a very distinctly British blue-collar comedy that we're really excited to get into. Um, before we do that, guys, just if this is your first time tuning in, this is a show called the Unproduced Table Read here on the Popcorn Talk Network. It is a show where we table read Hollywood's hottest unproduced pilots and features, and um, again, we're reading an amazing kind of dramedy called Grafton that... Uh, we're gonna get into soon, but before we do that, I'd love for my cast to introduce themselves and who they'll be playing on the show today. What's up, guys? I am Timothy Michael. You can reach me out, uh, everywhere at I am Timothy Mike. Um, you uh, today, I will be playing Jono, Short Suit, King Yogini, Waiter, and Kelly. Top of the morning to everybody. Uh, my name's Mike Kalinowski. You can find me at Mike Kalinowski. I'll be reading for let's see, uh, Carl, Darren, Tall Suit, and Big Barry. Hey everybody, I'm Andrew Guy. Uh, today I'll be reading for Evo, Gary, the barman, gruff employee, and the cocky punk. Uh, I'm Tony Hamilton Shannon. Uh, I, I wrote the script, and I'm going to be reading uh, Robbie. Hey guys, Roxy Stryer, and, <laughs> and I'll be reading for Jennifer, Kid, Spotty 20 something, Irate Shopper, Language Tape, and Female Voice. Hey, I'm Haley O'Connor, and today I'm reading Mandy, Stacy, hipster student, Norwegian cashier, repair guy, old lady, trip and slip number one, Allison's mom and security guard. <laughs> Keeping her busy. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Adrian Snow, and I'll be reading Allison. Um, so if you guys are fans of the show, you probably tuned into our episode Blackfriars, which mm -hmm. was um, also a British-inspired script about a group of kind of millennial homeless living in a tube station. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to bring back the British today. Distinctly, we're actually going to be playing... Um, Scousers, which is like a Liverpool-based dialect. Um, that being said, Tony, I'd love for you to kind of talk about the script that we're going to be reading today and sort of give us a one to two minute intro into the world we'll be entering and maybe like the distinctly Liverpool attitude of this script, if you would. Uh, yeah, so this is um, this is set in the, the area that I grew up in. Um, I very much grew up in, in Highton, which is where it's set in Liverpool, and uh, specifically in this beautiful working class environment. Uh, um, and basically, it, it, the, the, the aim of the script is, is, is it, it's set in this environment where people are, through one way or another, have been kind of crushed a little bit by the system. So, you know, to, to be poor in England at the moment, or and for a long time, uh, has been quite tough. And it, there, there seems to be in our society a little bit of a, a, a misunderstanding of, of poverty and there's, there's definitely this attitude of you know if you're poor it's kind of your fault because hmm. you didn't work hard at school and and my experience having grown up in in uh in this environment is very much the the it is such a, a almost you know bernie sanders talks a lot about the rigged society and mm -hmm. it very much is rigged in the sense that there's so kind of little opportunity with education and 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 you get a poor education and then you get low paying jobs and jobs that pay below a minimum wage and or a minimum wage that's below a living wage and 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 uh what bernie sanders calls uh um starvation wage and it is such a struggle often to just live a normal life to just live kind of what i sometimes say is that, you know the second rung on the ladder we all know the first rung on the ladder like abject poverty mm -hmm. But a lot of the people in society, you know, they just want to live on that second rung. They just want to uh, kind of uh, have a, a car and, and go on one holiday a year. And it, it's, not, it's not really a lot. And it is such a struggle to just have that kind of life. And so this is kind of set in that environment. And there's about four people who have been found themselves pushed into low level crime as a way of, of making uh, ends meet. And through things that happen in our story, they are going to decide that they want to up their game a little bit mm -hmm. and the question is are they skilled enough uh to 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 up their game <laughs> absolutely and the thing i love about this script tony is that that intro kind of makes it sound like this very serious almost <laughs> the wire-esque approach to poverty but the script is hilarious um and i don't want to say much more because i want to save that for our discussion but um yeah i'm really excited to read it today and thanks for being here it's gonna be great thank you um, so guys, this is the pilot script to Grafton, written by Tony Hamilton Shannon, and let's go. Before we get into the script, there's actually a little prologue, um, and it reads like this. 
The Urban Dictionary defines grafting as follows. One, to work hard or make something out of nothing. Two, earning money by whatever means, mostly shoplifting, car fraud, blagging, street robbery, car crime, or prostitution. And five, when a girl rubs a guy's penis with her underarm. <laughs> so I feel like that's the tone of the script that we're diving into today. You caught me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, this is Grafton. Interior dingy office day. The saddest conference room in Liverpool. Lime green paint fights its way off the grimy walls. A fly buzzes at the window, desperate to get out. Robbie, 32, a savvy scouser with a charm and wit that belies his lack of formal education, sits in a shirt and tie, fixated on the fly. Up, down, left, right. No matter how it tries, it can't get out. Everything looks normal here. Two suited men, one tall, one short, sit opposite Robbie, browsing his resume. Clearly a job interview. One final question. If you were to get the job, what skills do you think you'd bring to the role? Robbie sits up, confident and composed. Uh, well, I'd say I, I'm, I'm a strong leader. Smash cut to exterior the North Sea night flashback. A Nordic ferry battles through a storm. Cal, you're wearing Aladdin. <laughs> interior Nordic ferry, disabled toilet continuous. Robbie and three men, Carl, Evo, and Jono, we'll meet them later, brace the room's walls as the rocking boat threatens to tip them over. Robbie tosses Carl a long black coat, nicknamed Aladdin due to its cavernous pockets, custom made to store their stolen spoils. Jono, you're on lookout. Evo's playing the drunk. Aye, aye, Captain. He swigs from the bottle of Jack Daniels. Playing the drunk, not being the fucking drunk. Concentrate. Back to interior job interview present. Uh, I have good communication skills. <laughs> Cut to interior Nordic Ferry duty-free shop. Flashback continued. A small room with a few aisles displaying the usual duty-free wares. As the storm rages, Norwegian cashier battles to keep cigarette cartons on the shelves behind him. Robbie argues. I know the sign says cash a card, but a traveler's check's just as good. He pokes a traveler's check several times to maintain the cashier's full attention. Across the shop, Carl slips perfume boxes and liquor bottles into the coat's endless pockets. The cashier eyes him suspiciously. Cue for Evo to stumble to the counter like a 400-pound drunken girl. Move, move, I'm going to be sick. Please, sir, no. Uh, as the cashier scrambles for a sick bag, Jono sees a security guard approaching and puts on a baseball cap, a coded signal for Robbie, who fakes stumbles into the post guard stand, almost knocking it over. Carl sees the ruckus and casually saunters out the door, past the security guard, to safety. Back to interior job interview present. Uh, I'm cool under pressure. Cut to interior Liverpool docks, customs, continued flashback. Passengers disembark the ferry. Police officers and sniffer dogs circle. Robbie, Evo, and Carl wait as customs officials search their bags. I told you, I don't know either of these fellas and you've already searched all my gear. Jono strolls past, holding the hands of his two daughters, seven and 11. His oversized <laughs> backpack bulges with cargo, the black fabric of Aladdin poking out the top. The customs officials wave the happy family through. And I have plenty of experience in sales. Interior of the Quiet Lamb Pub day. The doors swing open as our four lads burst inside. We got booze, stuff to make you smell nice, your wife smell nice, <laughs> your hands smell nice, if that's all you're getting. Teams of punters crowd around the guys. And some frozen North Sea salmon, apparently. He frowns at Carl. Where the, or why the hell did you steal that? Carl shrugs. Why not? Back to interior job interview present. The two suits are impressed. Very good, Robbie. And I'd be delighted to say we'd love to offer you the job. Robbie raises to shake their hands, although not quite with the enthusiasm you'd expect from someone who just landed a job. A short suit addresses the room. We understand why. Now, in, in a real-life situation, you probably wouldn't be offered it on a spot like that. But hopefully you get the idea. Reveal. We are in a job center classroom where 20 or so bored job seekers sit watching. And don't forget to do the job search on your way out, Robbie. Time to put all those skills you mentioned to good use. Robbie fakes a smile as we smash to titles. Interior job center day. Robbie stands at a job search computer terminal. He jabs at the buttons, scrolls through a list of jobs, McDonald's, Tesco, data entry, all part-time, zero-hour contracts on minimum wage. <clears throat> One post sparks his interest. Wanted. Talented, dynamic, self-starter with a keen business brain. He clicks for more information. An apprenticeship at a hardware store for 16 to 21-year-olds. <laughs> Typical. He logs out. Match cut to a slot machine. 
eerily similar to the job search computer. Uses the same touch screen, same buttons, same hopeless disappointment in the <laughs> user. The only difference is that this machine has more noises and flashing lights and more pictures of Top Gun. The men currently hoping to line up the three fighter jets is our drunken gorilla Evo. 35 years old, six foot two, a friendly giant, but a ticking time bomb of rage. He reaches for a packet of potato chips that someone has opened out like a, sh a sharing tray just as someone slaps his hand. It's our sticky-fingered Carl, 29, waxed hair, expensive clothes, and the center of his own universe. Get off me crisps. You open the pack. We see that they are in the corner of Interior of the Quiet Lamb Day, a day-drinking pub where the working class come to sacrifice their paychecks on the altar of despair. They're open so I can get them. It's a universal sign for Sharon. You see everything as universal sign for sharing, you fat bastard. In interrupted by Gary the barman shouting from behind the bar. Oi, you bowed off like that. I'm still waiting for you to fix from your last bloody tantrum. A huge crack runs right down Tom Cruise's face. That wasn't me. I saw you do it last night. Now off. I said off. Evo gives him killer eyes. All right, Evo, I don't want any trouble. Robbie rushes in from the brain and pulls down his hood. I'd take his advice, mate. Stop pissing your life away in a game that's rigged against you. It's not rigged. Robbie points to a tiny block of text on the corner of the machine, announcing the payout percentage of 70%. You see that? That number guarantees that over your life, you'll never get back what you put in. <laughs> not me, mate. I'm good at it. <laughs> <laughs> he presses hold, then nudge to demonstrate his point. The buttons are bollocks. There's simulating choice where there is not kidding you that with the right set of skills, you can somehow beat the odds. You can't. Across the room, our single father of two, Jono, carries a tray of pints. Already balding at 32, he's the bluntest knife in this four-man drawer with a goofy grin that makes you want to hug him every time you see him. Snaking through the tables, his blue hold all smacks the heads of everyone he passes. Sorry, sorry, mate. Sorry about that. Sorry. Oops, watch yourself. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> he reaches the guy, still arguing over the machine. You talking about cricket? Oh, probably not. Here's your drinks. He distributes the three pints, but gets confused when there's only one left for him and Carl. That can't be right. He tries a few more combinations, but keeps coming up one short. <laughs> Robbie puts him out of his misery. I just got here, mate. Christ, I thought I was going stupid. <laughs> Robbie signals for the gang to join him at the table, their business headquarters. A hexagonal beast tucks in, a, a hexagonal beast tucked in the corner. The kind of table where no one can hear you, and the kind of place where, even if they did, no one would hear you. <laughs> Robbie takes a seat, quickly noticing that only Jono has joined him. Evo still pops pounds into the machine. Evo! Uh, in a minute. And Carl is now chatting up a girl at the bar. Is he taking the piss? They've been flitting all day. <laughs> the girl slaps Carl, throws her drink over him, and storms out. Carl returns to the gang, now covered in beer. <sighs> Shag last week, apparently. You'd think I'd remember that ugly mug. <laughs> Can we get going? Okay, all right. So, I might have something I might have something up at the charity shop in the village. Got a fella making me a key. We're not doing charity. It's not charity. It's two dickheads fleecing everyone else. We're not doing charity. You want to contribute, then? One minute. He keeps popping pounds. Robbie swallows his frustration. I picked these up in Mallorca. Johnny unzips the blue hole doll. 30 cartons of cigarettes. Oh, fuck are these? Siggy's got them cheap too. Carl pulls out a carton full of Spanish writing, a brand you've never heard of. Full tuna. No one's gonna buy Spanish ciggies, you blit. You sell Spanish ciggies all the time. Benson and Hedges, Marlboro Light, Spanish versions of what we sell. Give me a rough log em. So, I was thinking of doing a business job. We took two grand last time. Didn't the feds nick the case? Evo can get another. Evo, seriously? But to you... Robbie's surprise, Evo's right there at the table. When is a tenner? Off Robbie's reaction. I know, rigged game. House always wins, but I put 40 quid in it and she's about to give out. Who's that, your ma? <laughs> Carl and Jono laugh. We told you, it doesn't work like that. The odds never change. Don't touch that! He's screaming at a terrified man about I, to use the machine. I bet you a hundred pays out on the next go. Come on, Neville. Well, he's only gonna learn the, he's only gonna learn the hard way. A hundred quid, yeah? They look at Evo. Surely he's not that unhinged. Evo snatches the coin. I'll take it in twenties. <laughs> he struts to the machine, strokes the rim like he's about to make love, kisses the coin and holds it above the slot. Penetrates slowly, savoring the moment. <laughs> Points back at Carl. Prepare to pay up. Then readies to release when the machine goes dead. Evo looks down to see a repair guy unplugging the power. The fuck are you doing? Changing it? The face is cracked. <laughs> Your face will be cracked if you don't plug it back in. Plug it back in. 
Repair Guy stands, a scrawny 19-year-old as tall as Evo with the confidence of a kid who's won every fight he's been in. Calm yourself, soft lad. You can play this one. A Back to the Future slot machine stands next to him. My money's in that one, and she's ready to pay out. Doesn't work like that. We try to tell him. <laughs> Evo's eyes glaze over. He pulls back his fist, ready to kill this kid. Until Robbie grabs his arm. What the fuck are you doing? He's stealing me 40. He saved you 100. Evo's eyes finally show recognition. The Hulk remorphing into Bruce Banner. Yet Repair Guy hasn't flinched. Robbie puts his arms around him, shouting to the barman. A bevy for the kid and a shot of Jaeger. Give us five shots of Jaeger. <laughs> the kid relaxes and tensions are diffused. Exterior, Robbie's council estate, midnight. Well-kept gardens sit next to derelict war zones. The juxtaposition, startling. A broken down wall looks like it's been, there th been that way for years. Bottom of the council's priority list, like everything else on this street. Robbie stands outside a block of flats, drunk, fumbling for his keys. A sign warns, no ball games. A cruel joke for a patch of grass which couldn't host a ball game if you tried. Robbie looks up to the second floor window. All the lights are off. He staggers forward, trying to be quiet. Interior Robbie's bedroom moments later. Robbie creaks inside, creeps inside as someone sleeps peacefully under the covers. He stops for a creaking floorboard. Shh. He slips off his clothes without a sound, lifts the covers, almost levitating as he majestically slips between the sheets without disturbing the sleeper. Rests his head on the pillow, sighs relief, success, and suddenly a blinding light fills the room. A half-naked Allison, 26, stands at the door, brushing her teeth. She has a manicured innocence that always seems to get her exactly what she wants. Where have you been? Robbie whips back the covers to see who lays in bed. Just the pillows. Surprise. I got caught up at the, the job center. Allison eyes the clock. 1 a.m., she switches off the light. No time for his lies. <laughs> Interior Robbie's flat, hallway moments later. Robbie stumbles through a series of yoga outfits hanging from the door frames like carcasses in a butcher's freezer. He's still, he's still a little drunk as he passes into a small kitchen where Allison chucks ingredients into a blender. Eggs, ginger, chia seeds, all in precise proportions. Her nightgown shows off the kind of slender, sculpted body only acquired through a strict diet and dedication to the gym. Robbie sits at the table. It's set for dinner with an unopened bottle of wine. Uh, you, you, you cooked? Nothing special. She flips on the blender, <sighs> clearly pissed off. The noise grates Robbie's brain. Ah, uh, the, 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 most girls would, would give me a rollick and coming home drunk at midnight. You're making me a recovery drink. Well, we can't have you hungover when you're out there looking for jobs. She pours the smoothie into a glass and hands it over. Did you call Darren? First thing this morning. Because I saw him today. And it, it went to voicemail if you let me finish. <laughs> Did you leave a message? I don't like leaving messages. Robbie, he's got a job right there if you call him. Uh, fresh foods, come on, love. He stands up, putting his arm around her. She pulls a few ra rashers of bacon off the grill. Robbie reaches out for one, but she moves the plate away. They're mine. Since when do you eat bacon? Since I was stuck in the bypass for two hours after the Fiat broke down. <sighs> Again? We'll, we'll get a new car. And the bathroom tiles? Also on my list. It's been on your list for six months, but they're still broken. Wh where is this coming from? She starts sobbing. Robbie instantly flips to compassion. Oh, babe, babe, you okay? You okay? What's what's going on? I just feel like we're going in circles here. Okay, you, you want me to call Dan? I'll call Dan. And first thing tomorrow, I promise. I'm sorry. Ignore me. You know how I get to my period. Not <laughs> off. He squeezes her until she laughs. She playfully hits him, then buries her face into his chest, desperate to hide the guilt. You still haven't told him? Interior gym day. Allison and Jennifer, 30s, outspoken, heart on her sleeve, sit on opposing yoga mats, stretching their glutes. It may be a gym, but Jennifer's in full makeup and hair rollers. He was drunk. So? He was drunk when you conceived the fucking thing. He can be drunk when he hears about it. <laughs> I will once he's spoken to Darren. Your dickhead cousin? You can't have Robbie stacking shells in a fucking supermarket. Allison rolls her eyes, projects to the rest of the room. Downward, dog. Reveal she's leading a yoga class packed with women of various ages, most of them also with hair and rollers. A day of preparation for their Saturday night out. They slide into downward dog, all except Jennifer, who sits front and center, chatting like it's just the two of them. Well, your brother does all right. Evel's been sacked from every job in Liverpool. He'll take what he can get, but your Robbie, even as a kid, he'd been charged 10p to... Ride his go-kart down the hill. He should be running bleeding fresh foods, not shoveling shit on the f floor. An old lady's had enough. Why? I work at fresh foods. Nobody shovels shit. What shit? Oh, <laughs> metaphorical shit. It's all right, you. You're in your 80s, love. 
I'm 52, you cheeky bitch. <laughs> no mistake, girls. Yoga's a peaceful art form. Stop fucking talking then. Keen Yogi, 30s, a few mats down, is in the best downward dog you've ever seen. <laughs> this is an important conversation. You're not even doing the moves. We're in downward dog, not dog by the fire. You'll be doing dog by the fucking hospital bed if I come over there. Girls, I said, no ma fucking stay, all right? <laughs> Jennifer. But Jennifer can't let it go. Dog by the fire, the only dog in here, fucking skank. <laughs> the two girls dive on each other, fists swinging. Exterior football field day. A crowd of seven-year-olds chase a ball around a football pitch. For you American listeners, that would be soccer, but of course this is a British script. Carl, Robbie, and Jono stand watching. <laughs> give it! Give it! He's unmarked, but no one's fucking passing. He's talking about Callum, who wanders the pitch totally uninterested. Robbie's phone beeps. A text from Allison. You call Darren yet? XX. He puts the phone away and takes a breath. You, you, ever, you ever feel like maybe we're going about this all wrong? <laughs> like we should be watching, like we should be the ones playing and the kids watching us? <laughs> what? No. I, I'm, I'm talking about the stuff we do on the side. It's like, on the side of what? You know, at this rate, we'll never get out of Heighton. Which one's Heighton? Release him! Release him! There's kids on the team <laughs> other than your lad, Carl. Lower your voice, knobhead. Are you kidding? <laughs> the only one who doesn't know he's yours is the lad himself. But if the bitch of the mother finds out that I'm coaching his team, she'll be banged up. Pass the ball, you greedy bastards! He's shouting at a wiry ginger kid who is hogging the ball. Because <laughs> you're being real sort of like. Isn't that your stalker? <laughs> they look across the pitch to see Mandy, 34, with a do-it-yourself haircut and cardigan <laughs> buttons all in the wrong buttonholes. What the fuck is she doing here? Stalking, probably. <laughs> That's pretty classic stuff. <laughs> she does seem to be staring right at Carl. Probably here to watch Big Baddy, son. I heard they're seeing each other. Whoa, that's not right. How old is he? Seven? Big baddie, not his kid. <laughs> Which one's that? Who'd you think? The wiry ginger kid hogs the ball some more. Pass it, you tent! Hey, Big Baddy will kill you talking to his lad like that. <laughs> that middle twin's too far too busy to come to the game since we went legit. Big Baddy, legit? Fuck off. It's true. I own three nightclubs now. One of them sponsors a shirt. <laughs> Which is when we see that the logo on these young boys' shirts is for the Lava Lounge, with the silhouette of a dancing woman that could definitely be a stripper. Oh, this is what I'm talking about. How long ago was he just grafting just like us? But you can't make money like he made it. He'd snap your legs off just pissing in his toilet. Half the fellas you see in a wheelchair there because of him. A couple of men in wheelchairs sit around the football pitch. <laughs> Even the feds are terrified. You don't have it in you. And bigger, and bigger means more risk. I can't do that to the girls. I've had enough of this. Off comes his tracksuit, and wait, is he... Substitution number seven! He <laughs> is. He's subbing himself on. Cow! It's only friendly. No age limit. <laughs> and he's on. Dribbling the ball around kids half his size. Skips past one. Shoulder barges another. Face palms two more <laughs> before blasting the ball into the back of the net. What was he doing? And a team goes wild in celebration. Parents shout and complain. <sighs> it's the only way he gets to hug his kid without him knowing. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has stopped celebrating except for Carl who holds his son in the air, doing airplanes all around the pitch. Suddenly, Evo cuts past them on a bicycle, a 12-year-old chasing him. What is this now? The bike gets stuck as Evo tumbles off it and keeps running, reaches the guys as the kid catches up. I'm telling me that you robbed me bike. I hired it off you, yeah. <laughs> he shoves a fiver towards the kid who snatches it and leaves. Evo fights for breath. He might be dying here. Everything all right. He throws on a duffel bag and the contents spill out. Bolt cutters, a flame gun, a welding mask... Jono pulls out a brown jumpsuit identical to the one worn by the repair guy in the pub. Jono reads the back. Jensen slot machines. Why have you got this? But Robbie already knows. Eyes burning with anticipation. We're taking down the house. <laughs> <laughs> Exterior, binocular, point of view, day. Through a double-rounded lens, we see a large warehouse surrounded by a single looping road. A tall concrete wall defends the perimeter. I saw him pick up more machines this morning, so I followed him and watched him drop them off here. We see the repair guy lift a slot machine out of his van and wheel it into the warehouse. He returns for another. I figure this is the most. <clears throat> this place must cover half of Liverpool. Weekends peak earnings, so we can't have them sitting in pubs broken. As Evo talks, the binocular point of view slowly moves to a butterfly fluttering amongst the leaves. Jono! The fuck are you doing? Exterior industrial estate continuous. We reveal that the guys are sitting on a grassy hill overlooking the warehouse. Jono plays with a pair of kid binoculars, distracted by the local wildlife. That are Stacy's. The crap. <laughs> they really are. The lads are no further away than the binocular point of view. I'm trying to tell the job. He puts them down, and suddenly Carl's phone rings. Evo is about to flip. This is his moment. Shite. It's Mandy. Should I answer? 
It took you two court cases to get rid of that crank. <laughs> the ringing stops, and Carl sighs relief. Look, he doesn't empty them. Just throws them in there. And, and the fellow who fixes them, who does empty them, I know him. Carl's phone rings again. For fuck's sake. He cancels it. <sighs> now, the guy who fixes them only works Monday to Friday. I know this because his weekend job is stopping at the bar, falling over at Queens. And here's the best bit. The repair guy closes the shutter behind the last machine. No alarm. Yeah, that's right, no alarm. Just locks up and fucks off. I Meaning next Sunday we suit up, drive in, and rinse the lot. Evo looks mighty pleased with himself. This has hardly taken down the house, Evo. I mean, what, what we got, five, ten machines, a few hundred quid in each? And, and what if the alarm's set another way or, or the machines are empty by someone else? The place is empty. The van pulls up to the electronic gate. Evo's right. Other than the repair guy, there's no one else around. You said yourself, these bastards have been exploiting us for years. Stacking the odds, taking our cash. Your cash. And yours. I've lent it off to you many times. This is our chance to no longer be the victims. Like Govera and Castro, scrambling to Congos. Rifles in their hands, justice in their hands. All right, it's all right. Let's not make this another Che Guevara thing. <laughs> but we can't drive in, right? There's CCT everywhere. Jono can drop us the other side of these trees. Look, look it's like there's a CCT blind spot on the corner. We'll jump in there. Send Carl in to test the alarm. Why, oh, it's me. Because you're the quickest. Don't penalize because I'm one of the only, I'm the only one who fucking exercises. Fine, I'll go. No, 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 I'll do it. Like Jono said, I got the best body. Hey, he didn't say that. <laughs> it's what he meant. In it, Jono? Jono shrugs. There's a cinema the other side of the industrial estate. We'll come out after the last showing, and Jono can pick us up there. Any problems? Carl's phone rings again. He tosses it into the grass. No problems. Interior gastro pub bathroom continuous. Jennifer covers her freshly acquired black eye with concealer in the mirror. Her, her hair and makeup is the popular Liverpool style of go big or go home. <laughs> Next to her, Allison fixes her own hair, a lot more subtle. You don't tell them I will. No, it's not the right time. And when's that? When it's bouncing off your vagina using the umbilical cord as a bungee rope? Oh, just promise you won't say anything, please. Interior gastropub evening establishing. Specials boards, pints of cider, families nattering over their Saturday night dinner. Over f our four guys and the two girls sit nattering. Jennifer and Allison whisper about Carl. You didn't tell me that dickhead was coming. Don't make a scene. A promise she can't make. A waiter places a drink in front of Allison. Decaf coffee. Allison tries to shush him, scared the guys will hear. The waiter can't hear. She whispers again a little louder. Unpastrays. <laughs> Everyone heard that. Allison sinks into her chair, waiting for the backlash, but no one reacts, except Jennifer, who glares in disgust. Across the table, Jono's two daughters, Stacy, 11, and Kelly, 7, return from their arcade machines. Can I have a double bass, Dad? Make sure you get your sister one. A double bass? School's given orchestra lessons, and we can choose what we want to play. How much is, it, is a double bass? 800. Pounds? Christ, Stacy, can't you just play the recorder like I did? I don't like the recorder. Jenny picked violin and Liam picked trumpet. I want to be double bass. I just forked out for your uniforms. If, and if I get you that, I'll have to get Kelly something. Cassie Mansion. <laughs> what? Kelly jumps on his lap. <laughs> for my dolls. Cassie Mansion. You, you, you're missing my point, love. They need somewhere to live, Dad. They're homeless. <laughs> <laughs> and in a few weeks, they'll be back on the streets when you switch to something else. No, they won't. What, what about when you wanted to be an ice hockey goalie? I, th I bought you the gear, mask, pads, took you to witness every Tuesday. Three weeks it lasted. Now it just sits in your wardrobe covered in dust. Kelly crosses her arms, pouting like her life depends on it. I'm sorry, love. Things are really tight right now. Maybe, maybe next year. On Jennifer, watching Jono as he gives the girls a couple of pounds before they run off. Robbie, what you think of kids? <laughs> Allison kicks out under the table. Uh, uh, what was that for? Shit, wrong person. Kids are great. I mean, the whole point of our existence, obviously. Clasping Allison's hands. I mean, not right now. Kids are probably ruin our lives. Everyone laughs. laughs. Bit of an exaggeration. You know what I mean. We're still sorting ourselves out, aren't we? Well, it's not like we wouldn't manage. I mean, you don't want to just manage, do you? I mean, look at Jono. His kids, kids are brilliant, but every time that he has see coins fly out of his pocket like he's a fucking Pez dispenser, <laughs> he just bash on his head and it's pop, pop, pop. It's through. Yeah, but once you see the little faces, you do anything for them. Except keep your fucking dick in your pants. Jen! We, we all had it. Parents scrimping, saving, stress almost killing them. 
It's not like I want to give them the world. Just a couple of holidays a year, a few ice creams in New Brighton. Come on, Evo, back me up. I can't keep a bird long enough to have that dilemma. <laughs> it doesn't always take that long. <laughs> they all laugh, except Jennifer. Do you want to fucking slap you? <sighs> We're talking about kids. I've got one. I can't talk about it. You do have to sacrifice, like. I remember when Vanessa was pregnant. She stopped coloring her hair. Ended up gray as a wizard's beard. <laughs> <laughs> Allison becomes hyper aware of her four months of roots. But again, no one notices. She's almost offended. Who wants a bevy? Pint. 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 I'll take a pint of go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> they don't do that on draft anymore. Only bottles now. <laughs> you can shove one up your ass then. Well, go on. Allison. Oh, just a lime and soda. The conversation stops dead. Sure, that's the thing they'd notice. Your eye love. Of course. <laughs> you don't want a drink? I'm getting a drink. A drink, drink. It's Saturday night. I know my days of a week, Robbie. You sure you're all right, though? Lads, she can't drink. It's bad for the baby. He looks around the table <laughs> and the sea of blank faces. Did people not... It is obvious she's not drinking, growing her roots out, ropey skin. I do not have ropey skin. Bigger tits. That's a good one. Behave. <laughs> she's not pregnant. It's all the same with Vanessa. Decaf, coffee, no cigarettes. She doesn't smoke. Exactly. <laughs> we <laughs> tell him you're not pregnant. I'm not pregnant. Jennifer kicks her hard under the table and again hits Eva. Fucking hell! Girls! <laughs> Allison, what's going on? Nothing. Suddenly, a waiter brings over a sandwich. Someone ordered a peanut butter and... Disgusted at the thought. Bacon sandwich. Gross bacon grease drips <laughs> all down the peanut butter, all eyes on Allison. We need to discuss this. Interior Robbie's flat, bathroom day. Robbie marches inside the small bathroom carrying a toolkit. Allison hot on his heel. He steps over a pile of new tiles and a tub of filler and climbs into the bath where a section of the towel is about eight tiles short. He pulls out a trowel. You wanna talk? You can start with how you've known three months, but you still haven't told me. Oh, do you not hear yourself tonight? Robbie applies filler to the wall. It's hypothetics. Like if you ask me if I wants to watch Goodfellas tonight, I'd probably say no. But I mean, if we flick over and it's on, I mean, Who's gonna turn off good fellas? <laughs> he keeps working violent and frustrated strokes. I, I, and you, you can't use tonight as an excuse for the last three months. I mean, I mean you, you honestly think I'd make you get rid of it. She doesn't answer, just stares at the tiles. Allison! I think they're the wrong color. They're not the wrong color, will you just answer the question? I don't know. I mean, who says I wanna keep it? Robbie can't believe the hypocrisy. He gets back to hate fixing the tiles. <laughs> I don't wanna keep it. You just don't want it with me, right? Because that's that's the only thing left. She doesn't answer. Robbie looks at the tiles. Shit, these are the wrong color. <laughs> it's true. He pulls them off one by one. Well, aren't you going to ask why? I, I can't change who I am. He takes a chisel and hammer to one of the tiles. It's not you. It's what you do. What are you doing? I'm getting a sample. Can't you even trust me with this? Oh, and, and, and what I do is nothing compared to the shit your family gets up to. And you know what it's like growing up with that? A dad in prison, a mom an alcoholic psychopath. I'm not your dad, right? I'm careful, we won't get caught. Are you kidding? The best day of my mom's life was the day he got caught. It was years of sleepless nights, not knowing if he'd even come home that killed her. Robbie lays down his tools, softer now, loving. <sighs> I, I, I wouldn't put you through that, all right? Why, why do you think I'm at the job sense every week? You. This baby, you're everything. What more do I have to do to prove that? She looks at him hopefully as we cut to interior fresh food supermarket day. Evo and Robbie both wear fresh foods uniforms, strolling down an aisle. Look, Evo pushes a, a bread trolley. Four things you'll need to notice, Flack. One, most employees are on zero hour contracts, so you'll just as easily get no hours as 40, meaning we're all in competition. Fresh Foods Girl restocks eggs as Fresh Foods Boy flips several egg cartons off her cart, smashing them onto the floor. Fresh Food Girl wipes them up before anyone sees. Two, watch out for the trip and the slips. A claim on your aisle will seriously reduce your hours. I see you! A suspicious woman lurks near a pool of orange juice. Go on, get going. Off her reaction. Don't give me that. I saw you knock it over, jog on. She drifts away. <laughs> Three. A sick day also docks your hours, meaning it's more contagious than a doctor's right waiting room in here, so stay close of dead men walking. They pass a fresh foods zombie bumbling through the aisle. He hawks into a hanky like he's spitting up the plague. Fucking hell, Evo. How do you enjoy working here? You're not so supposed to enjoy it. It's a job. Besides, get six months under my belt, Darren says he'll show me management ropes. <laughs> what belts have you ever had six months under? <laughs> this belt, right here, dickhead. Not yet, but things are changing. 
They turn the corner to see Darren, 35, ginger, full of self-importance, giving a spotty 20-something a rollicking. It was him. What was me? Who stacked, who stacked the new bread in front? Fuck off. Evans, I warned you about language on the floor. New products always behind old. Otherwise, I have to reduce them, and then you know I hate doing that. It wasn't me. Yes, it was. Robbie sees that Eva was about to snap this kid in two. It, it, it was me. Sorry, Darren. I, I just didn't realize. Robbie, I know it's your first day, but don't act like it gives you reasons, license to act like a fucking retard, yeah? <laughs> You're not a work fit hire. Darren struts away. And number four. Your mate Darren's a massive twat. <laughs> Interior of the Quiet Lamb Day. Evo plays the slot machine. Carl and Jono on either side. Robbie sits next to them, flicking through the local paper, circling houses to rent, then circling no DSS on every single one. How are you supposed to find a house where minimum wage won't cover rent and none of the landlords accept pals and benefit? Get a council house. The baby's your golden ticket. And what if we end up on, a, on an estate like ours? Parts of me's muscle like Gaza Strip. I want to give this kid a fighting chance. I, I just don't understand how two people, both in work, can't even afford to rent. Pointing out one of them. Tiny shit box house without a government top up. Evo pops more pounds into the slot machine. Why are you even playing this? We're taking the money anyway, aren't we? Not from this one. I'm trying to maximize profit. <laughs> Evo's words jolt Robbie from his funk. Why not from this one? Because it's broken. Not yet, it's not. Interior, Robbie's flat morning. Allison stretches before a run. Robbie kisses her goodbye. We'll start early in the morning. Exterior, row of terraced houses, day. Um, Stacy and Kelly jump out of Jono's taxi, run into the house of Granny Mac, 60s, who waits at the door. We have two days to put as many of these in slot machine hospital as we can. We'll each take different sections of Liverpool. Interior bus. Evo reads a book on the Cuban Revolution, <laughs> stands up to let a pregnant woman take his seat. Sits somewhere else and immediately stands for another pregnant woman. The bus is full of them. Make sure they're Jensen's. Interior random pub. Carl checks the side of a slot machine. Jensen's. And go to town. He shoves a knife down the side of one of the buttons and pings it out onto the floor. And remember, vary your methods. We don't want to cause suspicion. Begin destruction montage. Robbie snips an electrical cord with wire cutters. A hammer smashes a large button to pieces, swung by Evo. Jono looms up to a machine, nervous, no, terrified. He chickens out and moves away. Robbie squirts self-setting foam into a coin slot. Carl has the back panel open, short-circuiting the board. A slot machine tips over and smashes, pushed by Evo. Jono lingers around the same machine. Someone passes so Jono pretends to play, and then quickly moves again. Carl pours liquid solvent over the buttons, jamming them. Robbie lowers the full weight of a tilted machine onto its electrical plug, crushing it. Jono strides towards his nemesis with a newfound confidence. This is it. This time it's on. Or maybe not. No, still too much. <laughs> he turns to flee, but a drunk bumps into him, spilling Jono's pint all over the machine. As the lights fade and the electric wires pop and fizz, Jono's panic morphs into prize. He did it! What the hell, I just replaced that. Reveal, it's the Back to the Future machine in The Quiet Lamb. Jono slinks away. Evo struggles to tip a machine due to a low ceiling beam, but he has an idea. He picks up a pint of beer from the table next to him, not his, and downs it, causing a burly guy to throw a punch. Evo ducks. He throws another, this one cracking into the front of the machine. Just what Evo wanted. Evo pushes him off into a huge guy who starts swinging as we cut to exterior pub day. Evo strolling out of the pub, a mass bar brawl visible through the windows behind him. He slips into his fresh food jacket <laughs> and lights a cigarette. Cool as anything, as he crosses the road towards Fresh Foods. End montage. Interior Fresh Foods shop floor moments later. Robbie deals with an irate shopper. I understand, sir, but if we're out, we're out. I mean, just try another brand. Are you mad? Robbie sees Evo strolling in. Darren intercepts. Where have you been? Lunch break? You're six minutes late. Griggs was packed. Come on, mate. Uh, don't make me. My office now. Robbie turns back to the irate shopper. On me chips, on me burgers, on me butties. I have tomato sauce on everything. It has to be high. Okay, but like <laughs> I was saying. Interior Darren's office moments later. Put it down. We can't see what Evo is holding, but it's enough to have Darren terrified. Apologies, then. You called me a C-U-N-T. No. <laughs> I called you a cunt. <laughs> <clears throat> Just because you have a different color name badge doesn't make you better than us. Uh, I'm sorry. Whatever you want me to say, just, just uh, put it down. As Evo lowers the object, Darren signals for two tiny guards, five foot three, to close in. But Evo's eyes sparkle with mischief. He raises the object to his lips, and we now see that it is 
a Tanway microphone. <laughs> Interior shop floor, same time. Robbie continues with the irate shopper. Okay, but uh, have you tried Big Daddy's? I mean, it's quite nice. We're... Interrupted by Evo's voice blasting across the store. Attention, shoppers. If you're feeling stressed, store manager Darren Henderson will be spending the next couple of hours deep throating cocks in the bakery aisle. <laughs> Faces drop in horror. Robbie cringes. Yes, buy 12 hot cross buns, get a free blowjob. And don't worry if there's a queue, this fella can guzzle two or three at a time. <laughs> a man looks at his wife. Should we go? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Interior of Darren's office continuous. Darren wrestles the microphone off Evo and speaks into uh, it. Uh, apologies there, shoppers. <laughs> that was not an act of promotion. Anyone who bought hot cross buns in exp expectation of fellatio will be entitled to a refund. Get him out of here! Interior Fresh Foods shop floor moments later. The tiny guards attempt to escort Evo's hulking frame past Robbie. Darren arrives, ragged tie and ginger hair a mess. I said get him out of here! But the tiny guards are terrified. Come on, Robbie. Let's leave these pricks to it. I can't, mate. That's right, Evans. Some people have responsibility. People who- All right, Darren. Evo can't believe it. Storms towards the exit, stops to flip, a huge milk cart on its side as gallons of milk flood the floor. Three trip and slips spring into action, <laughs> racing across the spillage and one by one hurling themselves into the air. Oh, I slipped! Did everyone see that? Darren shoots daggers at Robbie, who stands there, feeling like the worst friend on earth. Interior, Jono's house, living room, evening. Posters of One Direction and Disney princesses clutter the walls, clearly an inmate's running the asylum situation. Jono sits on the sofa with a cup of tea in a puzzle box. He runs his pen through a circular maze, going well until, bang, dead end. Screw it. He drives his pen nib through the wall, cheating his way to the finish point. As Stacy walks in, he snaps the book closed like a naughty schoolboy. Dad, watch this. She hands him an iPad. On the screen, a YouTube clip of a guy bustling a groovy, busting a groovy beat on a double bass. It's actually pretty cool, the kind of clip that makes you want to learn, especially if you're 11. I know we can't afford it, but... She flicks through the iPad. This man's selling one on Gumtree for three fifty. Now, if I get no pocket money for four months, that's... She flicks to a set of complex calculations. £216. For my birthday last year, I got 70 but even if I only get 50 because of the economy and the bedroom tax, that's 266 So the remaining 84 is that right? Jana's got no idea. <laughs> if you split that between my birthday and Christmas, done. It breaks his heart to have to tell her no. I'll make you a deal. Find an instrument for under 50 quid, and I'll get you that. And if you still want a double bass after Christmas, you won't have to use any of your pocket money, okay? I'll see if they need someone on the tambourine. Hmm. As they hug it out, someone clamors down the hallway. Clump, clump, clump. It's Kelly, seven, dressed head to toe as an ice hockey goalie. Huge shin guards, <laughs> oversized gloves, a hockey shirt, helmet, and face grill. All too big, of course. It's adorable. You're still not getting a Cassie Mansion, Kel. <laughs> She turns around and clump, 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 stops back into her room. <laughs> Exterior back garden cookout day. Robbie and Allison carry food into a garden too small to hold a cookout, but giving its best effort. Shitty disco music drowns out boring, depressed chatter. They approach Darren, flipping burgers at the grill. He's wearing a novelty apron, a naked muscle man complete with a fake, a hairy fake penis yeah. sewn into the groin. Testicles and all. It's horrific. Darren. One of the perks of fresh foods. Get to keep any stock that receives over 2,000 complaints. 2,000? I know. PC go matter what. <laughs> Robbie places down a lasagna whilst Allison hands over a jug of green smoothie. Well, we've got your vegetarians covered. And this is a kale smoothie with one of my beef activities. Still waiting to see when... Blends. Still waiting to see when your genius health recipes might be lying in our fresh food aisles. Ha! Huh, right. Like that ever happen. Even though she thinks about it every day. Their attention switches to a 50-year-old woman drunkenly sleezing over ner a nervous man across the garden, his unimpressed wife beside them. Isn't one o'clock a little early? Yeah, not if you start it last night. Sighs, heads over. Come on, Mum. <laughs> Meet the McEwens. Enjoy the hot dogs. Once the men are alone, Robbie switches on the charm. Great party, mate. Wanna be a... Is the pub Jewish? Robbie gambles that this means yes and hands him a can. Open opens one for himself, gingerly broaching the issue. So, uh, about Evo, uh, what can I do to, you know, help him get his job back? Darren puts down the beer, disappointed. Don't bring this to my house, Robbie. Work, Darren. Work, homework, you understand. Two Darrens. <laughs> there must be something, though, right? Evo and me, uh, you know, we grew up together. He's family. See that beautiful woman over there? Allison is now playing peekaboo with the cute baby. She's your family. That baby, family. Not that baby. The other one. <laughs> I don't know who the baby is, and that makes you my family, which is why I'm going to help you out. Uh, Grace, thank thank you. Look about. Look about. What do you see? 
Robbie looks around. Shitbox house, fence falling down, garden overlooked by two blocks of flats. Success, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You know who owns this house? <laughs> uh, your mom? Oh, okay, te technically, yes. With the whole thing, right to, right, whole right to buy thing. But I pay the mortgage, and I see, and you see the conservatory? Finish this week. That's my money I'm earning now. Uh, you wouldn't call that a porch? They're referring to the tiny add-on, big enough to fit a few <laughs> chairs and a bike. The glass makes it a conservatory. But with the coziness of the porch, I'm glad you appreciate that, fellas over here, <laughs> fellas over there who did it. And I can get him to have a word if you like. Ah, uh, thanks. But I, I don't think... Uh... Right, because you rent a flat. <laughs> Robbie really wants to punch this guy. But this is the path you're on now. You know, the CEO of Fresh Food started on the shop floor. And now he's seven million here. Seven million! Imagine that. Last Sunday of the month is stock check and shift is stock shift stock check and shift assignment. Come in tomorrow night. I'll show you the ropes. See if you can get up the ladder a bit more quickly. Robbie's phone chimes. A text from Jono. Last film gets out at one a.m. Uh, I I just remembered. I, I I've got plans tomorrow night. Life is what happens when you make other plans. John Lennon, <laughs> song about his kid, no less. He pulls out another identical novelty apron. So what's it to be? Working class hero. A nowhere man. He puts the apron over Robbie's head like a weird anointment ceremony. Robbie watches Allison, who now holds the baby, everybody cooing at the mother-to-be, taking a test drive. She catches Robbie's eyes. Darren grabs Robbie's fake penis to adjust <laughs> it in the front. What is going on? Robbie's smile quickly fades as he sees Allison's mum, hammered, swiping at the baby like a maniac. It's my turn. Stop hogging it. Someone manages to scoop her away before she claws its eyes out. Robbie sighs, knows what he has to do. No fucking way. Exterior, the ducky lane, same day. The sun shines bright over a beautiful lake. Being heightened, it's surrounded by rubbish bags and graffiti and sits right next to a highway. We're not postponing. Evo and Jono fish while Carl sunbathes in tight speedos. Robbie stands. Carl language. Sorry, girls. Jono's daughters giggle. Jono gives them half a loaf of bread as they scamper to the water's edge to feed the ducks. We spent all week, all week doing machines in. It's gonna be tomorrow. I've got something. More important than this. Robbie looks guilty. No, 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 not the Sunday shift. That ginger cum stain <laughs> dangles out in front of me for six months and you've been there for four fucking days. Talk about nepotism. Evo stands up pacing, ready to explode. Just like 1990, 1967. You might as well be sending me off to Bolivia while she calls you up next to the Russians, you fuck. Evo, I'm not Fidel Castro and you are not Che Guevara. Bloody too, right? Even Castro wouldn't stoop to this fucking law. <laughs> Evo storms off to join the girls by the ducks. Look, I I'm sorry, lads, all right? I, I just need to concentrate on this fresh food things a while, you know? We're still trying to trying on the house and all that. Carl stands, applying what looks like cooking oil to his ripped you body. You can't come off bonnet benefits, <laughs> you mug. You're about to have a child. There's like a million people eating out of the food banks. Half of them Muppets like you trying to raise a family in minimum wage. Guess I'll take the girls bowling then. We're still doing it. Not without Robbie. We're a team. Evo's the muscle, I'm the driver, he's the brains. I'm the fucking brains. You're the balls. I'm the dick. <laughs> I'm the dick, balls and the brains. The whole fucking show. And I'm not losing a payday because of being a nonce. Now will someone, out, now will someone do my back? I meant Jono. <laughs> Jono takes the oil and begins rubbing it onto Carl's torso. <laughs> Just remember to park on the hill. We know, all right? We don't need your fucking side coaching. Interior of Robbie's front room evening. Allison sits on the sofa browsing her laptop. She surfs a personal training website with pictures of herself in all different yoga positions. She clicks on a new client's tab. Zero. Great. She's interrupted by a series of bangs and clashes from outside the window. She looks out. The house across the road is being raided. Police flood inside. Chaos screams. On the other side of the room, Robbie puts on a shirt. Davies marijuana farm. Looks like it. Those poor kids. Allison's point of view. Two toddlers stand crying as a mother consoles them. Police carry trays of marijuana plants down the path. Allison approaches Robbie. I appreciate this. I'm doing it for us, not you. Oh, I know, but it's the first time in months. I haven't had this knot in my stomach. I know Darren can be a bit of a bellend sometimes, but it's just until we get out of here. Allison takes Robbie's tie, the same one he wore for the fake job interview, and ties it for him. Isn't this the one your dad used to wear? <laughs> yeah, people thought he was crazy. Well, why is the wind the cleaner wearing a tie? But he'd say... A tie won't stop people disrespecting you, but it'll stop you disrespecting yourself. Looking down. Uh, how's that going? She's completely butchered the knot. How am I supposed to know? Interior fresh foods evening. A, a security guard waits as the last shopper leaves. He closes the main door and bolts it shut. Interior staff room evening. 
Darren addresses a crowd of employees, Robbie amongst them. Tim's frozen food, Betty's on milk. Any questions? Remember, the CEO started where you are, and now he's on seven million a year. <laughs> they amble out of the room, all except Robbie. All right, Chief, how can I be of service? Hey, you can lose the tie for a start. This ain't your parole meeting. <laughs> Robbie takes off the tie and shoves it into his top pocket. Doesn't let it dampen his enthusiasm. We'll start on the road. We have 90, what, we have 90 staff, but only enough work for 20 hours each. Uh, divvy up the shifts according to the percentage, performance percentages. He sits Robbie at a, com at a beat up Dell computer. So I, I was thinking about that, right? Like everyone does an eight hour shift till stock and shelves, the bakery, whatever. But it's like eight hours doing the same thing. It's tough, monotonous, like. So what if you have the shift, right? So you do four hours on the tills, have your break, and then four hours on the bakery, like mix it up. That's brilliant. Okay, well, I don't think. How long you been here? Five minutes? Already tell me how to do my job. Who's training who here? Eight hour shifts are easier to rota. But if that's the only reason, I'll figure that out. I mean, I just think it'll, you know, increase motivation. These are entry-level jobs. Motivation is moving up the chain. You've got some people doing them 20 years. Then they need to work harder. Do you know how the CEO started on the shop floor and now he's... Seven million a year, I know. You have to speculate to accumulate, Robbie. Key principle of business. That could be you one day. Maybe, but can't be all of us. Darren's eyes narrow on the verge of a full-blown pissing contest, interrupted by a gruff employee at the door. Uh, Darren... I'm not feeling well. I think I'll have to go home. Fine, but that's strike four. When are the others? You got two last week for 15-minute toilet breaks. That's how long it takes me. <laughs> then you're going to have to when you don't need to. You need to wait until it's kicking down the door. That way, you can be in and out. And I won't be paying you to sit on a shit or read magazines. Robbie can't believe what he's hearing. The employee goes to argue. Ah, it's turn back is another strike. He points to a wall chart of strikeable offenses. Sure enough, it's on there, with many more including chatting to customers in bright socks. Give your jacket to Robbie. To Robbie. Looks like you landed on a snake. Interior staff cloakroom moments later, gruff employee hands over his fresh foods jacket. It's not contagious, is it? Nothing wrong with me. Big Berry's hiring extra security for his slot machine place. Better than working here for this prick. 250 a night. Take me weeks to earn that here. Big Barry has a slot machine place? Yeah, they had a ton of breaks this week. I reckon someone's up to something which is crap. Like, who'd be stupid enough to run from Big Barry? Robbie feels the walls closing in. Exterior, interior, taxi, night. Carl, Ev Carl and Evo sit in the back and Jono drives. They're lost. The left here. It's right, dickhead. Will you decide? <laughs> Evo's phone rings. It's Robbie. He palms it off to Carl, still mad, and Carl answers. We're busy. I don't give a crap. What's he saying? Big Barry owns Jensen's. Big Barry, no, 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 no. Just drive, there's, you. There's a van. Follow that. Jono follows the repair van down a ramp and through an electronic gate. Carl continues barking down the phone. He thinks because he's Robbie's fucking big bollocks that he's not here. Interior staff cloakroom continuous. No, Robbie paces on the phone. No, listen. He's hiring extra guards. But Carl's hung up. Darren pops his head in. There you are. Here. Throws Robbie a mop. Looks like somebody shut themselves in the cereal aisle. <laughs> Interior taxi continuous. They come to a stop. Can you believe the jib him? Like we're gonna fucking, like we're gonna fuck it up. Why we stop? We might have a problem. Please tell me you did not drive in a fucking compound. On the taxi, in the compound. Concrete walls, steel gate closing behind them. No way out. Interior fresh food cereal aisle night. Robbie shields his nose as he lifts a pair of shit-stained boxers with a wooden spoon dropping them into a trash bag. He picks up the mop to attack the brown residue, and Darren arrives. Using your phone in the staff room? That's your first strike. Can't show you special treatment. I can give you this, though. Hands Robbie an envelope. He opens it. That feels good, huh? Being a provider? And this is for the whole week? It's a paycheck for 127 pounds. May not, like seem, much, may not seem like much now, but this is the beginning. Remember, you gotta speculate to accumulate. He slaps Robbie's back and walks away. Robbie can't believe it. 127 pounds. He swallows it down and gets back to work. Bends over to move the mop bucket just as his dad's tie tumbles out of his top pocket, landing right in the brown sludge. Robbie picks it up, dripping with shit juice, and he stares at it. Exterior, industrial estate, night. At the back of the warehouse, the repair guy unloads machines. Jono's taxi sits on the looping road in the dark. They haven't been they haven't been seen yet, but it can't be long. Inside the taxi, Evo and Jono watch the repair guy taking his sweet time. Jono lets out a nervous squeal. Relax, we'll wait until he's done and follow him out. On Carl, scurrying through the shadows, he's gone to investigate. He pokes his head around the front of the building to see them roving 
to see the roving torch of the security guard heading right for them. Exterior, interior, taxi moments later. Someone's coming. We can't move until he's done. Well, we can't stay here. Robbie was right. We should never have done this without him. Fuck off! Away from our signal. Exterior, industrial state moments later. The security guard patrols the front of the building, ever closer to turning the corner and seeing the taxi. Repair guy drops off the last machine. He pulls down the warehouse shutter and fumbles with the lock, taking forever. Carl watches from the corner. He looks back at the taxi, a sitting duck. Repair guy locks the shutter and Carl finally signals for the taxi to creep forward. Slowly, slowly. Oh no. Repair guy's taking a piss. Carl halts the taxi. Security guard approaches the final corner. Is that something on the floor? He bends over. Repair guy now enjoys the longest shake in pissing history. Carl could kill him. Security guard examines a badge. Nothing of interest. He pops into his pocket and rounds the corner to see nothing. The taxi's gone. Exterior industrial estate, same time. The taxi creeps past the freshly locked shutter, the repair van now gone. Carl opens the door and jumps in. The repair van follows the road back around to the front of the warehouse. The electronic gate opens and the van leaves. As the taxi turns the same corner, the guys see the open gate. Quick, go! Jono puts his foot down. It's a wide opening, but they might not make it. The taxi picks up speed. Faster, faster. The gate closes. Smaller, smaller. Go on, we're gonna make it! No, we won't stop! Yes, yes, we will. Keep going! Jono's going for it. He knows they can make it. His fingers tighten around the wheel, knuckles white, and then... He slows down. What are you doing? They were never going to make it. <laughs> what the fuck do we do now? Exterior warehouse soon after. The taxi creeps around the perimeter of the warehouse at walking pace. How is he not heard us? <laughs> taxi point of view. They're only 20 feet behind the patrolling security guard. Who walks oblivious? On the security guard. We see for the first time that he's wearing headphones, listening to a Polish language tape. In English. I like your smile. Do you have a sister? Then in Polish. I like your smile. Do you have a sister? <laughs> Behind him, the taxi chugs away in silence. Mm. I like your smile. Do you have a sister? <laughs> <laughs> That's in Polish. Inside the taxi, Jono, Jono stares at his odometers. Uh, lads, more than news. Worse than this? What out of petrol? You didn't fill up? I thought I'd go after I dropped you off. Save me sitting around. Well, we, well, there'll be plenty more sitting around when Big Barry puts us on a fucking wheelchairs. The taxi pulls into a dark corner and stops dead. Jono turns on his taxi light. What are you doing? Oh, sorry, a bit. <laughs> he turns it off. No, that, that might work. We can act like we're looking for the fare and get lost. Jono turns it on. Looking for a fare with two people in the back? Turn it off, Jono. He does. Turn it on, Jono. It's the best chance we got. <laughs> Jono turns it on. <laughs> on the cab, sitting in the darkness, the yellow taxi light flashing on, off, on, off, in tandem with the argument inside. Inside the cab, the argument continues until... Is that another guard? Sure enough, a second guard materializes in the shadows. I thought there was only one. There is. There was. A torchlight shines bright right at them. He's seen us. Uh, has he seen us? <laughs> the silhouette closes in. He's definitely seen them. Oh, no, 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 no. Grab something. Grab a weapon. Evo tightens his fists. Carl whips, uh, whips out the bolt cutters. Jono grabs a crossword pencil. They brace up, ready to go. The door opens. Bloody hell, lads. It's like Blackpool fucking lights out there. It's a park on the hill. Robbie climbs in, a huge sigh of relief. We got lost. No, we didn't. We're doing a job. What part's this? We ran out of petrol. <laughs> Would you shut up? <laughs> well, the guard's going to see you any minute, so assuming this isn't part of the plan. Let's go. Evo, I'll need your help. Robbie and Evo climb out of the cab. Stop looking at me like that. Like what? He's grinning like a kid at Christmas. Like that. Castro and Guevara. <laughs> <laughs> Exterior warehouse, concrete wall moments later. We see now that the wall is made of 12 vertically stacked concrete slabs, except for one section where Robbie, Evo, and Carl have removed 11 of them. They start on the last slab, but find that it won't budge. Fuck. <clears throat> Cemented in. Just, you're just got it, Jono. No, it's too high. You bust right through. You're not concrete, dickhead. It's true. It's only a foot high, but it'd be like hitting a wall. Robbie? I, I'm, I'm thinking. Moments later, Robbie directs Evo and Carl as they lower a concrete slab on top of another. We see that the slabs have been stacked in piles next to the wall. Four, then three, then two, then one, creating a mini staircase leading up over the last slab. Robbie signals and Jono drives up the mini staircase. The underneath of the car scrapes on the wall, but it makes it over just. Exterior industrial estate, dark road moments later. The taxi sits on a dirt road. Robbie, Evo, and Carl crowd around the driver's window. So this road goes to the cinema. Fill up, we'll meet you in half an hour. What about Big Barry? As our good friend Darren says, you gotta speculate to accumulate. <laughs> he throws Evo and Carl two brown jumpsuits. Exterior warehouse soon after. The security guard gives instructions to a new guard, gruff employee from Fresh Foods. Carl watches them from the shadows. On the other side of the warehouse, Robbie stands with his back to the CCTV camera. 
holds the shutter lock while Evo squeezes the bolt cutters with everything he's got and their brown jumpsuits with Jensen's logos. They look like just a couple of repair guys having trouble with the frosty lock. Carl sneaks out from the shadows. Hurry, there's a second guard. They're splitting up. Snap, the lock breaks in two. Interior warehouse moments later. The shutter rises a few feet. Carl's the first under. He waves his arm to check for sensors, even a few star jumps. Clear. Evo and Robbie crawl under the shutter and pull it closed. In the dark, they can just make out the silhouettes of 50 or so broken machines. They share a greedy grin. Jackpot. Until someone switches the lights on. Evo and Robbie dart behind a bank of machines out of sight. But Carl's right there in the open. Carl? <laughs> it's Mandy, his stalker. Uh, Ma- Mandy, wh- what are you doing here? I work here. What are you doing here? Robbie and Evo hold their breath. How the hell is he going to get out of this one? I'm here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing you last week, I, I couldn't get, out- get you out of me head. I had to see you. <laughs> one in the morning? Couldn't sleep. Why are you in a Jensen's uniform? <laughs> Found it over here. It's freezing. You should get the heat on in this place. <laughs> I was worried about this. After the football, I saw you and your mates watch me from the hill. I tried to call you then. I'm, I'm happy now. I'm with Big Barry, and I can't ever go to that dark place again, so leave. She moves forward. Carl sees that in a few more paces, she'll spot Evelyn and Robbie, and they'll be screwed. But, but I love you! She stops dead. You had me committed. Two years of drugs and psychotherapy destroying my mind so they could break my obsession with you. And it worked. You look great. Clearly better. And that's why I'm here. (laughs) So we can be together. (laughs) She tries to hold her resolve, but her eyes soon melt as her heart fills her head with madness. Oh, Carl. (laughs) Interior warehouse moments later, Evo and Robbie get to work popping slot machine locks. Next to them, an internal shutter pounds violently, with the thrusts of passionate sex occurring up against it. In the next room, Carl and Mandy bent over a table to the shutter. Oh yeah, tell me you love me, tell me you love me! On Robbie. He is in a new world of fuck. (laughs) Exterior, interior, taxi, night. Jono stops outside the cinema, pulls out a crossword just as a cocky punk Climbs into the back seat. Prescott Road, mate. Oh, I'm not taking first. Yeah, lights on. Shit, it is. Oh, it's meant to be off. Cabbie's code. If your lights on, you've got to take the fare. So Prescott Road, when you're ready. Will you get out of my fucking taxi? Right. What's your number? Breaking code, swearing at customers. I'll have that license took off you. Look, look, please, mate. Uh, th- there's plenty of other cabs. Thomas Johnson, five four seven. Is that his seven? Uh, Prescott Road. <laughs> Put your seatbelt on. Exterior cinema continuous. The taxi burns rubber out of the complex. Cocky punk clings for his life in the back seat. Interior warehouse, same time. Evo pops locks. Robbie shoves coins and notes into one of the two backpacks. Were these really the best he could get? They're his girls. <laughs> He's talking about the backpacks. Bright pink with Disney princesses. Then something catches Evo's eye. The Top Gun slot machine. Evo slowly gravitates towards it. He runs his finger along the jagged crack in Tom Cruise's face. Unfixed, which means unplayed. He bends down, trance-like, and plugs the cord into a nearby socket. The machine lights up. He raises a coin to his lips. The classic good luck kiss. Behind him, Robbie fills the backpacks with coins. Then something catches Robbie's attention. Something strange. Three rolls of cash taped neatly to the underside of the coin store. Maybe 25, 30 grand. What the hell? He turns to Evo and sees him pushing the coin into the slot. What are you doing? I have to know. <laughs> <laughs> he presses a button and the three wheels spin. First wheel, airplane. Second wheel, airplane. Third wheel, airplane. Lights flash and coins pummel the tray as the famous Top Zung, Top Gun song Danger Zone blasts from the machines to the score. A series of slow motion shots. Mandy's face being repeatedly slammed against the internal shutter, covered in sweat, loving it. Behind her, Carl naked from the waist down, pumping for victory. Mandy's head turns. What's that noise? Carl shrugs and keeps pumping. The guard, peering through a window, he sees Evo and Robbie in sprints, driving, diving for the red button. An alarm flashes. Robbie and Evo see it. They need to run, but not before. Swipe, swipe, swipe. Robbie grabs the three cash bundles and they flee. Interior warehouse, Mandy's office continuous. Normal speed resumes. The music is replaced by a burglar alarm. Uh, we're being robbed. Carl keeps going. Carl, we can't. But she's loving it. Uh, maybe a little more. Oh, no, we need to... Oh, yeah. No. Oh, that's good. No, stop. She pushes him away and grabs his pants. You have to go. If Big Barry finds out, he'll kill us both. Carl tries to put his hands on Mandy, but Mandy pushes him. There out. isn't time. As Carl bolts away... 
I never stop loving you. Right as Danger Zone music <laughs> kicks back in. Interior, exterior warehouse, same time. Robbie and Evo sprint for the wall, the guard in hot pursuit. They shine their lights behind him. Guard's point of view, two bright lights, like staring into the headlights of a car, unable to detail anything beyond them. The guard hears a scuffle to his left, swings his flashlight to illuminate, Carl's bare ass, bent over the wall, climbing for safety, jeans in hand. The second guard chases, but he's too late. The bare ass has run off into the woods, and both guards are left alone. End danger zone music. Exterior cinema, moments later. A large crowd ambles out to the last viewing. Students night, everyone 18 to 21. Robbie and Evo slip into the procession, throwing on their backpacks. A hipster student spots them. So ironic, guys. Love it. <laughs> He's referring to the Disney princesses. Goes for a high five, but they leave him hanging. Exterior cinema soon after. Evo and Robbie wait in the empty taxi rank. Where the fuck is Jono? A police cruiser turns down the street heading their way. The police, cruiser, the police officer scans down the street of students. And now the two guys in their 30s look a little more out of place. Disney princess backpacks or not. Jono's taxi careens around the corner. Jono sees the police cruiser and slows, pulls up next to the guys, and they climb inside. What the fuck, Jono? Exterior interior taxi moments later. The taxi cruises around the industrial estate. What is he? Uh, I saw him do Donald ducking it over the wall. Shouldn't be far. <laughs> Donald ducking it? <laughs> They're interrupted by Carl sprinting out of a bend, naked from the waist down like the famous cartoon character. <laughs> Exterior industrial estate continuous. The taxi pulls around Carl, four arms, drag him inside. Exterior interior, exterior interior taxi moments later. The taxi stops at a red light. A police cruiser sits at the light opposite the two officers staring suspiciously at the black cab. Inside the cab... They're looking at me. They're not looking at you. They are looking at him, straight at him. His entire future with his daughters... His entire future with his daughters depends on the next... 10 seconds. Relax, Jono. Just three guys coming home from the pub. The lights turn green. The light turns green. Jono pulls forward, slowly passing the cruiser. Why isn't it moving? Jono checks his rearview mirror. The cruiser pulls a 180, slipping right in behind them. Shit. Robbie. I'm thinking. Pull over. Hold on a sec. Pull over. We're not pulling over. Will you fucking trust me? Exterior, interior police cruiser moments later. The two officers watch the taxi pull to the side of the road. One officer grabs the radio, ready to call it in. Suddenly, the cab door opens. Carl staggers out, pants back on, hobbles to a cash machine, card in hand, swaying back and forth and looking like he might... Yep, he's throwing up. The officer puts down his radio, just a taxi full of drunks. On Carl, fake vomiting, he puts up his middle finger as the cruiser drives away. Interior, Jensen's Warehouse, Machine Store Night. A pair of biker boots march past ten or so slot machines, each with their bowels exposed. Three rolls of cash taped to the underneath of every coin store, except the last one. The last one is empty. It seems I only got this one. We move up the long leather coat to reach the troubled face of Big Barry, 36 years old. He runs his tattooed fingers down his ginger lumberjack beard. He has a maniacal calmness about him, like he might explode at any moment. Three goons and Mandy timidly wait his response. You didn't see anything, hear anything, even though you were next door. Mandy shakes her head. He steps in front of her so she can't avoid his gaze, waiting for her to cave, but she doesn't. He pulls her tight to his frame, burying his nose in her hair and inhaling. This is the love of, he has for her, intense with a hint of madness. And right now, she's terrified. Okay, babe. You see it at home. Does he know? She tries to act cool as she scurries out. Big Barry turns to his goons with a lot more menace. If they knew about this, they knew it belonged to me. And then what gang of suicidal fuckwits would have been so stupid to think they could take what's mine? Series of shots. Jono, typing an address into his GPS. Carl, in front of a block of flats, pressing a buzzer. Evo, opening the front door to his flat. He wades through the clutter and trash in his kitchen. Robbie... Holding the backpacks, hiding the backpacks in his wardrobe. He thumbs through one of the cash rolls. It's a lot of money. A tired man opening his front door, not happy to be woken. Through his sleepy eyes, he sees Jono. I heard you have an advert on Gumtree. Carl, talking to the building's intercom. It's me. What the fuck do you want? Just let me in. I'm not doing this anymore. Robbie, crouched in his empty bath. The adrenaline will be pumping around his body for hours. He attaches the final tile to the bathroom wall. Top job. Jono, dragging a double base case in a huge dollhouse up his path. The box labeled Cassie's Mansion. Evo, lying on his sofa, flicking through his saved programs on TV, chooses politics today and opens a beer, and Carl, still outside the flats. Come on, it's freezing out here. 
We see that the person he's talking to is Jennifer, standing by her intercom, thinking, frustrated. A few moments pass. Then, outside, the buzzer sounds. Carl opens the door. He's in. Robbie, sliding into bed, doing his majestic levitating act so as not to disturb the sleeping Allison. Yet Allison is only pretending to be asleep, staring at her bedside clock showing 4 a.m., eyes filled with anxiety. What has he been up to? Back to interior warehouse night. Whoever they are, I want them found, and I want them fucking dealt with. Is that clear? A fourth goon strolls in. Jacko, 40s, built like someone put a tank in a suit. He's carrying Carl's Jensen's uniform. Found this. Weirdly, it's not ours. Different badge. Not sure who made it. Big Barry snatches the garment, his furious eyes almost burning a hole through it. When he reaches the neck label, his ferocity melts into an evil, psychotic smile. I know exactly who made it. Cut to black. End of episode! <laughs> Woo! Man, Tony, I really like this script. Thanks for letting us Thank bring you. it on the show. Thank you. Um, I think I want to start by talking kind of about balancing comedy and drama with a clearly impassioned social stance. Like, how do you, because like we talk about this on the show sometimes, sometimes when a show kind of has a subtle kind of mission about it, <clears throat> right? You, you need to incorporate that mission subtly because we want to see narrative, you know? Can you kind of talk about doing that? Because you do it so well in this script. Well, thank you. Um, I have no idea is uh, <laughs> the, the reality. Uh, obviously, this is how I figured it should be done. But mm -hmm. that, you know, if, if it's working, then that's, that's great. Um, it, it is a tough one because on the one hand, it's also a pilot and you know, a lot of this stuff I would like to explore more subtly mm -hmm. uh, over the season and, and, and the stuff that I kind of have set up with, uh, with with how it all go does that. But you also kind of have to put enough in right. the pilot to let people know that that's what's going on, you know. Um, and so it, that was a very tough balance of like, how much do I actually put in the pilot? You know, because you put too much in, you give yourself nowhere to go. You know, right. if you like put all of the themes in, you put everything, it's like, it, it, but so it's, it's, it's finding ways that I could hint at stuff and set stuff up. So there's a lot of stuff that's set up in there that actually probably doesn't even land, but it's set up for what I want to do later on. Um, John O's whole kind of story arc, like what I want to do with, with his in the first series, the whole um, story arc about him and his kids and, yeah. his, and Stacey being uh, um, this gifted kid who's in a school that isn't working mm -hmm. for, for um, is not a very good school. And so he has this whole kind of storyline where he is trying to get her into a private, he wants to get her into a private school, but obviously he can't afford private school. He wants to get into like a local kind of charter school, but he doesn't live in the, the district for the charter school because it's one of those amazing things where publicly funded schools, I mean, in England, but also here, you know, I, where I live in Los Angeles, we live next to the borough of Carpenter charter school here. And we live just kind of two roads away from where it's, it starts. But to be in that, um, neighborhood is very expensive, you know, yeah. and this is a public school that's set up to bring a good education to people who can't afford it. Right. And yet with public money, with our taxes, it's it, the best schools are in the richest, you know, because it shoots property prices up and then people can't afford to right. live there. So it, it, it actually screws people over. And so he ends up having to, um, uh, lie basically to say that they're and ends up committing fraud and all and that kind of comes back yeah. but that that's something that i wanted to do but it's like that's something i just couldn't i couldn't even get it in here so well, it's i do want to talk about jono because i was so disarmed by how moved i was by that storyline like I'm, I'm known to sometimes get emotional during the show just because i love good storytelling but the scene of his youngest daughter and the hockey goalie walking in then walking out yeah. actually made me cry during our read like i'm <laughs> do you feel like jono is kind of your like secret weapon to really ground the script emotionally? Or... Uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you need that, you know, one of the things um, is trying to find ways for this stuff to land. You know, like if, if you do want to make something that's, that's, um, that's trying to inform, right? Or trying to open people's eyes or trying to sh shed a little bit of a light of like, this is what society, you know, this is actually how tough it is mm -hmm. to be poor and, and trying to, I guess the point of the script was to try and create a bit of a, an understanding, not quite justification, but understanding why people would go into crime and, and all that stuff. But you, you know, if you just have characters talk about it, or you bring it up too too much on the surface, it doesn't really land. You know, mm -hmm. people uh, people don't change their mind with their heads, right? They change their mind with their hearts. You know, you have to find a way to kind of emotionally impact someone. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's, that's, he's one of the tools that I'm trying to use and that, that of, of like you say, of, of, of bringing that heart and try and make those things land a bit more. We can feel really sorry for him. We can, we can see 
how much he sh how much he loves his kids, mm -hmm. how much he just wants to do anything for them, and just the si circumstances that he's in just won't stop us him doing that. And we recognise that the things that he wants are not big things. He wants to be able to get <clears throat> his his daughter a, 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 an instrument so that she can perform at school, like mm -hmm. which middle class and above like we all take that for granted yeah you want to play the double bass go ahead there's your double bass you know um and 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 so finding that where we can show that these just small things these ones that he's unable to do without committing crime showing that this is the way that he's able to provide for his kids mm -hmm. yeah and i think it's super cool how you do that balance of the juxtaposition of the absurdity of the comedy throughout but then you go and ground all these people by having real life issues with each and every one of them um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about that because I think it's always sunny in Philadelphia is one of my absolute favorite TV shows of all time, but it's getting towards like season 13 now and they've been doing the same thing for a really long time. And as much as I love their comedy, it, you don't really invest in them as much because they don't ever have moments of reality. And again, I love that show. Um, and I think what succeeds so much about yours is that it's so absurd that you get all of that, but then you bring it back to life or bring it back to reality by grounding all these people with every single one of them has a different story arc going on that we can all kind of relate to. Um, how did you, did, did you like, did, did you write it originally? It was so absurd. Or did you always kind of have this nice balance? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it, it actually dovetails really well with what the content is because, so Liverpool, if you don't know too much about it, Liverpool is quite, um, it's a poor city. You know, it, it's equivalent would be somewhere like Boston or Baltimore yeah. or stuff like that. You know, it's, it's, um, and it's quite similar to Boston in the, in, in the sense that it also has this unique sense of identity. Yeah. And it's one of those things where there's been a lot of hardship in the city over the years and the way that they've dealt through it is through humor. And so Liverpool is famous for having this very good sense of humor, of, of being very um, um, cheeky and self-deprecating and, and just being able to laugh at the, the hardest of, of circumstances. And so that's what I tried to kind of infuse into this script was this idea that we can, be funny with this is heartbreaking but we can also be funny with it and to not be funny with it, it's almost a disservice mm -hmm. because people in this situation and the, the people i grew up with and the people i still know like they're the most hilarious people i know <laughs> because hardship has, has, has kind of nurtured that and they can make jokes about the most heartbreaking things because it's the only way otherwise what else are you going to do um so so i always knew going in that that's what i wanted to do i wanted to present that kind of side of it with the same wit and humor that that people in liverpool have used to deal with all of that stuff mm -hmm. How do you feel like American audiences react to the script? Do you feel like do you feel like they're able to get it? I mean, we did clearly. The script resonated with me so much when I read it, but I totally get the Boston thing and Roxy's from oh, yeah. Boston. But how do you feel like Americans, do you feel like they really are able to fully understand like the Liverpool thing? I I, mean, I think yeah, I think most of the stuff that's going on in here is universal, mm -hmm. right? It's it's you, you know, we we spoke earlier about the stuff that's going on in America at the moment, and obviously you've got the rise of Donald Trump and all that stuff, and so there's suddenly, even in our society, in America's society at the moment, a huge lens has been flipped where people are like, what's going on here? Suddenly people are interested in, in poverty in a way that they quite weren't interested, when it starts affecting them, ironically, is when people get interested. Um, <laughs> uh, it's like, oh my God, you know, I was comfortable in my uh, middle class and up, you know, with lifestyle, but now suddenly actually poverty is affecting me because it's got a president that I, for a lot of people don't want. Um, and so suddenly now everybody's interested, which is weird. Um, <laughs> well, 25 years ago, it wouldn't have, like, people our age would have been like, what is this about? Whereas like now everyone our age is like, I know what it's like to be so poor. Yeah. You know? right. And it's like, it just, we relate to this so much. Right. Well, and that's what's, you know, what is terrible about it is, is it's one of the things that there's a few references to the 80s in here that's, that's, and that's one of the things that I wanted to do with the show is I wanted to give it a bit of an 80s throwback. Hmm. Um, and that's why with the slot machines, you've got, um, Top Gun. Top Gun and a little bit more on the nose, Back to the Future. Uh, but the idea, because we, specifically in England, you know, 80s was a very tough time for the working class. In, in, um, in England, we had Thatcher's Britain, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and it was very, very tough class, specifically in the North. And a lot of the policies at the moment are kind of coming back to that style of, of, of thinking, and a lot of the politics in, in England, although in the last 12 months, people have become a little bit more aware of it, so hopefully it's not gonna change, but it was this kind of slow creep back to back to this idea. Um, and yeah, the reality is that, you know, you, you look at how our society is going, and over the last 20 years, like, inequality is getting worse and worse. Mm. The, the, it's something like the CEOs, they used to be, a, I think it was a, a 20, they used to, there's a figure of, of, of um, 
the, the multiplier of, of what CEOs were earn compared to the lowest people. Uh, so like the CEO of, of Walmart, whatever, compared to people on minimum wage. And it used to be something like a multiple of 20. The CEO of Walmart now earns a thousand times wow. more than someone on minimum wage, which is just insane. He earns like $20 million a year. So we, in a society that is wealthy and is doing well, we should be getting better and better, but we're actually getting worse and worse. And so like you're saying, these problems are starting to afflict more and more people. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we've just had a big crisis in England where we have this thing with food banks, lots of people using food banks, which are you know set up for people to people who can't afford all of their food for the week happen to go and get free food. And there's, there's nurses working in an NHS who are using all this thing with nurses that happen to go to food banks. And it's like, it's no longer just the absolute poor, which is terrible anyway, but it's kind of slowly creeping up on what we are okay with, with the amount of poverty that we're kind of okay with as long as it's not us. It's kind of this slow rising tide. Finally, people are starting to be aware of it. You know, Bernie Sanders in this country was a big, a big part of that movement. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think unfortunately, a lot of the stuff is a lot more relatable, even yeah. amongst kind of our generation, right? As we're struggling with the same issues, yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's, I don't know, I can't hear myself in this, but um, it's very similar, like when you said Thatcher's England, it's kind of similar to what we were dealing with Ronald Reagan. And it's kind of known, unknown that Trump does, is always a big fan of Reagan and how Reagan ran, ran things, Reaganomics. So, it's almost as if there is a big schism between generations. Like, my parents grew up in, as adults in the 80s, and, um, you know, well, to be, we were, uh, about to use black urban professionals, so they were more... <laughs> Love that. Yeah, class. I've never heard that. Um, not yuppies, but buppies. And so they uh, kind of have a, that same schism when it comes to me, and, like, me struggling and being like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not poor, but I'm broke. Like, I'm just mm. not ever mm. able to get out of this, mm. and I don't know what to do. And they go, well, you just work harder. I'm like, no, <laughs> like, right. this is your fault. I mean, not directly, but it is like <laughs> a, a, that schism of generations of how they were able to kind of get a leg up. Both my parents, you know, my dad doesn't have a, a college degree. He got a GED, but he was able to get a leg up and join IBM and become a computer programmer. So the, the world was set up in a, a very different way for them than it is for us. Hmm. And we're kind of dealing with the after effects of things going along in such a way for so long without anyone acknowledging like, hey, inflation's kind of stabilizing at this point. We aren't really adjusting the right. things we need to adjust. Mm -hmm. And I think what's so cool is like, I think you've managed to create a script that's so irresistible that that social message would really speak to anyone. Mm -hmm. Like I think of, I come from uh, like upper middle class family in the Midwest. Great family, but definitely like a bubble of a community that I think can easily and often does turn their eye to this world yeah. and like i know my parents would love this show and like <laughs> i know it would make them think more deeply about like the subtle social issues you're exploring in this script uh, and i do want to talk about your process because you do a lot of broad things to kind of give us that message as you mentioned but there's a lot of subtlety in here too specifically choices like having that fly unable to escape out the window <laughs> and like the maze being unable to break through that wall can you talk about not only those choices but how you your process as a writer, how you get those into your narrative. Um, well, I, I think, you know, it, it's one of those things where once you know what your script's about, once you know what it is that you're, you're trying to do, and sometimes that takes a while, sometimes you know straight off the bat, or sometimes it takes a while to get there. But once, once you know that, you then start to see the opportunities kind of in everything. And so if you're looking at it through that lens, if I know, you know, you talk about um, the, the Jono's kind of situation, and I'm looking with, um, I, you know, I know that that's what the, the, the whole the whole show's about. That's what I'm trying to do. Then, yeah, like it, it, it makes sense for him because he's a cabbie and he does puzzles and stuff. And you, you start to see the connections. You're like, okay, well, I know he does puzzles. I want to have him doing a puzzle. And then I want to, you know, for Giano, it's like this little, that, even with the him breaking the, the machine, you know, for Giano, his, he's the most reluctant to be a part of all of this because he's so much to lose with his daughters. But even he is, is kind of in his frustration, it's these little moments of, yeah. of, of uh, breaking the rules, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, yeah, so it is, it is that balance because you don't want to overload people and you don't want it to get to the point where you're like, okay, I get it. I get your, what your show is about. Like you're hammering me with it. Um, and, and yeah, I, but the, and, and, and finding that balance is tough with everything. Sometimes you go, you know what, this is too much. I need to take this out. Uh, sometimes you are looking for those moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, one thing I'm interested in is obviously this show adopts a crime narrative, which is right. like very exciting to me. And first of all, hilarious. Like, good <laughs> job doing a slapstick crime boss in a like enjoyable way. Um, but what's interesting to me is as these guys make more money, they ascend. So like, how right. do you manage the social class schisms as we were talking about with increased wealth? Like, how do you plan on navigating that line as the show advances? Well, yes. Yeah, so, so, well, so the first of all is that, you know, and, and that's, let's get not, you know, this is first and foremost, a fun crime show. So we've spoke a lot about the theme stuff and, and, and that is important to me, but w what I want this to be is entertaining mm -hmm. and funny. And I, I really enjoy, you know, take all of the theme stuff out of it. I really enjoy the idea of these four characters trying to up their station, but not quite having the skills to do it or can, do they have the skills? Um, and, and so as far as going forward, the idea is that they don't quite have the skills, so they're not going to suddenly fall into all of this wealth. There is going to be this um, kind of uh, peaks and troughs of it, but then you're right, but once you start getting that next level of wealth, there's a whole new set of problems. So, so one of... Um, the, if, so Robbie's arc for the first season is that he, he has, they have this money. They have this $25,000. So they plan with, okay, they need to give it back, right? They want to somehow get it back to Big Barry because this is no good. But they think, okay, well, if we can use this money and turn it into 125 grand through our various scams, then we can then give the bit back, make sure that get back to it, and we'll have our own stuff mm -hmm. that we can do stuff with. Obviously, they end up losing all the money. <laughs> but... <laughs> There are there are moments where he does he does have that money or he does have that twenty five grand and what he finds is that he can't actually do anything with it because he can't he, he you know his big thing is he wants to get out of his estate he wants to get out of this flat there's drug raids going on across across the road um, he wants a better life for his kid so in the first season they're very much like motivated before this baby's born I want to I want just want to be in a house and I just want to be not on on a council estate that's mm -hmm. it. Um, but with this 25 grand, he's like, okay, I'm gonna go get a mortgage, goes into the bank. The bank are like, yeah, we're not loaning you money. You work at Fresh Foods, are you on a fixed contract? No, you're not even on a fixed contract. You're not even guaranteed any hours a week. No, we're not loaning you any money, like, see you later. Um, and then even with that, he's gotta find ways to launder the money. So there's, even once you, you know, the system is so rigged, and, and rightly, I'm not saying you should be able to more, launder money. But even that <laughs> idea that, you know, even if he has the 25 grand, because you think about it, a lot of people today are buying houses with money from their parents. Their parents will give them that down mm -hmm. payment. And then, it's, and then if they have a normal job, they can go and get a mortgage, great. But if you have, the big thing in England at the moment is, is these um, zero hour contracts, which are, are, you're not guaranteed any work. It's basically so just almost, like not being on salary? Is that what it is? Or no, like, it's, is it just like not even having guaranteed work? It's you're not even call? actually having a job. It's, it's kind crazy. of, yeah, it's basically where we're like, look, we're going to give you a job so you can no longer get, you can no longer really claim benefits mm. because you're you're getting a job. Hmm. But but we are just going to give you the hours as we, we see fit. So we may hire 100 people and only really have hours for 20 hours a week for everybody. So meanwhile, you're like, but I need 40 hours because mm -hmm. you're not paying me enough to be able to feed my family and kids. Like, well, it doesn't really matter, but you have a job, so, you know, well done you. <laughs> and that's, it, 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 it's, it's very tough. And then because it's not fixed contract, you can't, you've got no security. You don't know how, at the, at, the, at the end of the week, whether you're gonna have enough money to feed your kids, to, 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 to because you don't know if you're gonna get 30 hours, 40 hours, or 10 hours, right? Mm -hmm. And if you only get 10 hours, what do you do? Where does that money with come all the from? slip and flips? You right. <laughs> yeah. exactly. so funny, Tony. spending yeah. too yeah. long in the bathroom, yeah. <laughs> which did, is real stuff, by yeah, the way. Did you ever sure, work? You, you, were, you must have worked in this because, like, I've been I've worked in a grocery store, I've worked in restaurants, and like, this is exactly the type of shit you deal with from upper management that have nothing else going on. Um, I, I haven't I've worked in, in various jobs with, with shitty bosses, I haven't specifically worked in a supermarket, but I did I did a lot of research and. <laughs> And this is something that has, has been going on. Um, uh, there's a company in, in England called Sports Direct, and I don't mind name checking them because uh, they are awful to their employees. Uh, they might be getting better, uh, but, but they're, they're awful. And it is this kind of stuff where, not, you know, it, the thing where what it comes back to for me, and, and this is a huge part of Robbie's character, is the thing that I wanted to try and tap into with Robbie is this idea of pride, right? And because we kind of have this in our society, unfortunately, we kind of have this idea that if you're poor, you lose the right to pride, right? You lose mm -hmm. the right to be able to have, to not be treated like shit, to not be condescending, to patronize, to not be 
have a job that you're proud of, doing work that you're proud of, live in an area that you're proud of. Like all of those things are a luxury that they're like, okay, you work harder, then you 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 can have that stuff. And so that's what's that, you know, with Robbie, that's what I try to set up in this in this um episode is the idea if he goes straight and goes to fresh food, you know, this is a, a smart guy who is talented. He just didn't get the education to do anything with it. And he's treated like shit and he's patronized and it's all this stuff like, oh, if you spend too long in the bathroom, right. you'll get doctor hours, which is stuff that happens. Or if you dress the wrong way or if you talk to people or whatever in some of these companies, it's all used to kind of dock your hours. And then he's got this other path, which is him being a criminal, in which he's rewarded for being good. Mm -hmm. You know, he get, when he's good at his job, he gets more money. He has a team. He gets to manage people like he's in his element, you know, and he, he just wants that in the legit normal world and he just can't have it. Hmm. It's like a little bit of the Breaking Bad, except likable. I don't love that show. I don't yeah, I ripped, off, I ripped off Breaking Bad. That's no, what I'm saying. No, that's, I'm that's saying... Breaking Bad and The Wire. Those are the two. <laughs> no, no, no. It's totally its own thing. It's just, it's a beautiful way to motivate <clears throat> crime. I mean, like, I really think you've got something great here, Tony. So. Thank you. Thank and I you. think, sorry, just go, just to go back to, um, you know, Jeff's um, question about where, where, would, where would it take them if, you know, they do make more money, you know, and it breaks them out of these social schisms that we talked about i feel like that whole saying of you know you can take the boy out of liverpool but you can't take the liverpool out of the boy um goes to these four characters because no matter how much money they'll they'll make they'll always have this mentality of you know i don't have much money i didn't come from a lot right. so i feel like no matter how much money you do give them if that's the route you want to take i feel like they'll still always have this this humble and you know hustle attitudes to them well and then the and the other thing is and the wire does this brilliantly so you have to find a, a different way to do it in the, the wire but the wire deals with this absolutely brilliantly in the same in the way that they have avon barksdale actually get the money and actually um be able to step out of that line of crime and they find that one uh he he struggles to fit in he, it's not the world he's from so it's like how's he going to do this and two that world is full of corruption also yeah. Right. Yeah. you know and so that's kind of one of the things that i had an eye on for this like i i i was hoping that by the th i say hoping you know because you want it obviously it to get made and then um but hoping by maybe the third uh season they would get the money to open i want them to open a nightclub mm. and <laughs> so they're trying to open a nightclub and then opening them up to the world to this world of of because the, the the thing about this group is they're not they they're not ruthless enough to be gangsters, so they can't even succeed in that world. They're not those wow. guys, and that's kind of what you know Carl alludes to at the beginning. He's like you can't make money like Big Bang made money. He he'd break people's legs for yeah. not paying him, you know, right. for or for pissing in his toilet. I think is the um, the thing he says, and and they're not those people. So what you can go up the ladder and then show how, you know, I say the nightclub idea appeals to me because I like this idea of them trying to run a nightclub mm -hmm. and then suddenly find that there's people wanting to sell drugs. There's right. people willing to break their uh, windows down if they don't sell drugs. There's cops who want paying off. Suddenly there's all of this corruption. And, and really it does exist every level that you go up. Yeah. I mean, you look at um the banking crisis that we just had and and and, and all of the corruption that it ends up in the top level of the market and so it's out of society and so really everybody's doing something wrong but we are so scornful hmm. of these people in this kind of environment yeah um any questions for us tony i think we're a little short on time but uh no i just like to i mean thank you great job with all of the different accents <laughs> <laughs> oh. no <laughs> yeah i mean sorry, oh, sorry. oh i mean Jamaica like <laughs> Thank you for reading with us. Yeah, that, you helped a real yeah. accent. It helped so immensely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, and like, yeah, none of them were accurate. Your accents, but, <laughs> no, but no, but they were great. They're all uh, unique and distinct, and, and actually, it, it really helped to give it a flavor, um, um, which was nice. So it was really, so really good. So thank you guys. So great job with that. Thank you. Um, you got it. Um, and thank you for being here, Tony. I really want to see this thing get made. I think it's Me like I, I hate using these words because they sound pretentious, but I do think it's kind of an important show. And I would really love to see this thing get made. So that being said, where can people reach you if they want to buy this thing up? Uh, at my house, uh, <laughs> I guess. I don't. Uh, I'm not really on social media. But um, if you Google my name, which is Tony Hamilton Shannon, it's thankfully I'm the only Tony Hamilton Shannon that exists in the world. Uh, so you know, if you Google me, you'll find uh, my agents. Uh, the, 
company at England. There's uh, my agent is Linda Slyther, a management company, and over here, Three Arts. And you'll find various things that Great. you can contact me um, through that stuff. Awesome. Well, we can't thank enough for being here. Um, guys, if you like today's episode, I actually have a couple recommendations. There's a produced show on TNT that I watched this fall called Claws. Did any of you guys watch that yeah. show? Mm -hmm. Super, super different from this show, but I think it kind of addresses the same themes of kind of like likable misfits trying to get theirs. And that I, an EC Nash show? That's right? an yeah. EC Nash yeah. show. And I think it's um, s similar. I mean, I mean, just worth, if you like today's script, I would check out that show, and I really liked it. I'm trying to get more people to watch it. So, um, also, in terms of episodes that we've produced, um, episode 15, I believe it is, is a script called America, written by David Case. It's about a bunch of Jewish immigrants who move to America from Russia and find that the American ideal is not at all what they expected. So I think it kind of addresses some of the same social themes that this script addresses. And if you like the British comedy we read today, we read another script called Blackfriars. I forget when we read that, but ridiculous, hilarious, very British script that we enjoyed reading a lot. Um, this has been the Unproduced Table Read, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if Just so you guys know, these scripts are printed to us for free, heavily discounted, that is. Um, by ARA Printing in Burbank on Magnolia Boulevard, close by, close to you. Really good <clears throat> price scripts. Three dollars. Three dollars okay. for features. <laughs> and um, if you go with the promo code Table Read, you'll get ten percent off your order. So, the more people we can get in there, the better. Um, and thanks for tuning in, guys. We're back next week with another pilot, actually called Darklings. That's all about the romantic gothics um, in like Mary Shelley, Lord Byron, and kind of it's a supernatural horror show with them cool. starring. So it's a very cool. interesting script. And if you guys want to find me online, pitch me a script. You can do so at Jeffrey C. Graham. How about the rest of you guys? Hey guys, I'm Timothy Michael. Find me everywhere. See what I'm doing at I am Timothy Mike. <laughs> um, at Mike Kilinowski everywhere on Twitter. Uh, you guys can find me at Andrew Guy everywhere on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Roxy Stryer. Uh, at Haley O'Connor. <laughs> uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Missy Jean Snow. It's M S E D R I N S N O W. Guys, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you next week here on the Unproduced Table Read. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Yay. Phil Spitek, and the entire Popcorn go. Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Popcorn Talk Network or its owners or principals.